You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. A West Virginia House of Representatives candidate has a restraining order out for stalking women. Can you guess which party he's from? Why is it so predictable? The fact that I don't even have to say he's a Republican should be concerning to everybody here. His name is Derek Evans. Looks like he's running for a state seat, not a federal seat. Here's a quote from local law enforcement. Quote, Evans was found by Kanawha County Magistrate last year to have engaged in stalking and made repeated credible threats of bodily injury to a woman who worked at the Women's Health Center in Charleston, West Virginia. It's the state's only facility to offer services. Nine days after he was served, Evans violated the restraining order leading to an extension that does not expire until December 31st, 2020. Court documents provided by one victim's attorney show County Magistrate Joseph Shelton granted the order, saying Evans made credible threats and engaged in stalking as defined by the West Virginia State Code. Evans was ordered by the court to stay away from the victim, including her place of work. But nine days after being served, Evans showed up back at the Women's Health Center. When Charleston police officers responded to a call that Evans was violating restraining order by being at the center, he gave them false information about the court order. End quote. For the record, I don't like referring to victims of crimes like that as victims. I prefer to call them what they are, survivors. How did somebody like this even get on the ballot? How is this legal? I don't understand. Try getting a progressive candidate with a criminal history on the ballot. Absolutely zero chance of getting them through the vetting process. It's fucking disgusting. Pastor Jesse Sumter has been making waves on Twitter recently. He posted a tweet the other day that said, quote, Brothers, a friendly reminder for the election. Make sure your wife votes exactly as you do. That wasn't his only hot tweet. A couple days later, he said, quote, Welcome to the party. I'm serious about this. The husband is responsible for how his wife votes. He should not be abusive or a jerk about this, and he should seek counsel from his wife on elections. But at the end of the day, he's responsible. Obviously, he's trying to make the point that men are the head of the household, and women should be obedient to their masters. Here's another tweet from him. Quote, they should be united in voting. The husband makes sure this happens. If they vote differently, they cancel each other out. If they vote differently, the husband leaves his wife unprotected. If the husband won't vote for a guy, why would he let his wife do it? This dude is fucking bizarre. And again, as I said before, did I even need to tell you that this guy was a Republican? Was it even necessary? Why does this kind of anti-individuality mindset always come out of the Republican Party. It's like they're all about personal responsibility when it comes to a kid born into poverty with abusive parents who don't give a shit about them when they grow up to sell drugs because they have no other way to make money. It's their fault. They're on their own. But when it comes to his wife, she can't have a mind of her own. She isn't an individual. She's her husband's responsibility, and he makes decisions for the house. Because what, she can't be trusted to? This kind of ass-backwards mindset is disturbing to me. This dude is a total scumbag. He needs to be called out for it. Joe Rogan had Alex Jones on his podcast again recently, and it's been pretty controversial. For one thing, Alex Jones has been banned from Spotify. And as most people know, Joe Rogan signed a contract with Spotify recently to exclusively stream full episodes to their platform. Surprisingly, Spotify doesn't seem to have any creative control over Rogan's show. So why'd Rogan decide to do it? He said he doesn't believe in deplatforming. My opinion on this is complicated. I believe in letting sunlight do its work. People say Milo Yiannopoulos is an example of deplatforming working. He disappeared from the face of the earth. But I disagree. I think Milo is an example where sunlight Light did the trick. He said all kinds of stupid shit until it came to the point where his own side deplatformed him. That's what you need to be successful. You need support, and deplatforming tends to create enthusiasm among their base. Let them say progressively stupider stuff until they destroy themselves. At this point, it looks like InfoWars, Alex Jones's quote unquote news network, was pushed out of every corner of the internet except its own website. With nobody there to challenge his ideas, the group has become more and more radicalized. There's a trade off with deplatforming. If you let those bad ideas circulate in society, they move the Overton window, the window of acceptable discussion, further to the right. But they can't get too far without being challenged. If you deplatform, the ideas spread unhindered, and the people still listening become more and more radical and locked into their beliefs. It's the same conundrum you find with cults. So was Joe Rogan an error to platform Alex Jones? I don't think so. As long as he's sufficiently pushed back on his batshit crazy ideas, I have no problem with it. That being said, I have no idea if he actually did. I didn't even watch it. 
Our old buddy Jerry Falwell Jr., previous president of Liberty University, the religious school that his dad started, is suing Liberty U and the Lincoln Project for ruining his reputation. I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with the Lincoln Project, but it's a group of anti-Trump Republicans who basically created a super PAC to create and run anti-Trump ads. Anyways, here's a quote from PR Newswire. Quote, in his complaint filed in the Commonwealth of Virginia Circuit Court for the city of Lynchburg, Mr. Falwell claims that Liberty University needlessly injured and damaged his reputation through a series of statements published in print and spoken in large public forums and streamed online following his forced resignation from the university. According to the complaint, these statements had the effect of affirming false claims that an individual made publicly against Mr. Falwell after years-long attempts at extortion against Falwell and his wife, Becky. Based on research and investigation, this individual appears to be supported financially by political opponents of Mr. Falwell in the midst of a heated presidential campaign, likely including the anti-Trump pact called the Lincoln Project. The complaint, which includes claims of defamation and breach of contract, alleges that Liberty U officials accepted the false claims against Mr. Falwell without investigation to force his resignation and then engaged in a campaign to tarnish, minimize, and outright destroy the legacy of the Falwell family and Mr. Falwell's reputation. End quote. Falwell said, quote, I must take the necessary steps to restore my reputation and hopefully help repair the damage to the Liberty U brand in the process. End quote. No, bro, you fucked up. I'm assuming you're talking about the pool boy's testimony, but that's not even the straw that broke the camel's back. The pictures you posted were more than enough to tell us everything that we needed to know. What you did would have ended the careers of any student caught doing the same thing. And you were the president. Just admit you're a fuck up and disappear from public life like you should. Repairing a reputation that you destroyed in the first place is a pointless endeavor. We talked about Pastor Kat Kerr recently. She's an odd bird, to say the least. She's the one who talked about how she's seen God physically, in person. She saw him so vividly that she could draw a picture of his face if she wanted. She claims she goes to heaven sometimes and hangs out with angels and shit. Well, guess who she supports for president? Take a wild fucking guess right off the top of your head. That's right, she supports Donald Trump. And she says the angels do too. When she's hanging around the angels, sometimes I refer to Joe Biden as Sleepy Joe, just like Trump. But that's not where the mental illness ends. She went through this whole thing about how Jesus absolutely loves dancing, singing, and sweets. If you put a jar of honey on your cabinet, you can expect Jesus to be around. Honey attracts him. He's like a bee. He's nuts about it. Oh yeah, and apparently they have a processing facility in heaven for people who've lost limbs and pray for God to give him a new one. The heavenly secretary fills out a heavenly requisition form for a heavenly replacement limb, and a heavenly angel grabs the heavenly replacement and boxes it up in a heavenly gift box and walks through the person holding the heavenly gift box containing the limb, and boom, just like that, their limb is back. No, she's not joking. And yes, she really believes this shit. It gets stranger, so keep a lookout for it. We're going through the entire sermon. Before we get into all that, let's listen to some voicemails. Don't forget, if you want to call in and leave a voicemail, the number is 1-800-701-8573. Hey, this is Owen. If you're comfortable, leave your first name and state at the sound of the tiny truck backing up. Hi, Owen. Uh, My name is Stefan. I'm from Alberta, Canada. Uh, I was wondering, it's it's not really uh, related to anything, current events, but I was wondering what your opinions on, I guess you'd categorize them as folk religions are, um, like paganism of various forms. I myself am a Lokian uh, Norse pagan. Interesting. I appreciate the phone call. When I was a Jehovah's Witness, um, paganism was demonized heavily. Pagans were viewed as these sick, evil, depraved people who were going to die one day and just never wake up, and that was going to be it. That's like the worst that can happen to you in Jehovah's Witnesses' religion, because they don't believe in hell. After coming out of that religion, I've come to realize that pagans, for the most part, are just normal people, and there's nothing scary or evil about it. It's just, you know, another religion, whatever. But that's what it really comes down to for me, ultimately, is it's just another religion. I, of course, am an atheist. I don't, I have not found a single religion that seems viable or legitimate or reasonable or credible to me. 
at all. Paganism to me just seems, I don't know, vapid. It just, it, it, there's, it doesn't do it for me. There's nothing there for me. But I, like I said, I have no issue with pagan people. I have pagan friends, in fact. Ocean Keltoy, I don't know if you know that YouTube channel, the YouTuber. I talk to him pretty often. I've had him on my channel before to talk about paganism and things like that. But anyway, generally speaking, I just think paganism is another religion, but I have no issue with pagans in general. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sarah uh, Puelk, and I am from uh, Bristol, Connecticut. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm a transgender woman. Uh, how would Jehovah Witnesses go about trying to convert me, if they even would? Uh, I watched your video on a uh, woman, and uh, you basically sat there trying to do one thing at a time. But, um, yeah, I was just wondering about your thoughts on that. Uh, take it easy. Appreciate that. Um, I'll tell you what would probably happen if a Jehovah's Witness started studying with you. This is usually what cults do to varying degrees. Cults will try to be super ultra accepting of you and love bomb you and try to make you think that they're behind you and they support you and try to demonize the world, quote unquote, try to make you think that the world is out to get you and the only safe refuge is with this cult, with these people, with this religion. That's the tactic that they usually employ, all cults. The reason they do that is because they want to bring in as many members as, as humanly possible. Cults who are upfront about the people that they hate or the people that they don't accept for one reason or another, there's a higher social cost to joining it, and they will bring in fewer members. A group like the NIFB, that's a good example. Stephen Anderson's church, um, Faithful Word Baptist Church, they will straight up tell you up front that you're evil for being gay, you're evil for being trans or whatever else, and you're sick and disgusting and depraved, and you can't join unless you change. That's their position on it. As a result, Faithful Word Baptist, or the NIFB more generally, only has, what, 500 members between all the churches? I'm not sure how many. That's an educated guess. 500 to 1,000 is probably roughly how many churchgoers they have total. But Jehovah's Witnesses, their approach is different. They basically have the same positions. You can't be gay. You can't be trans. Uh, you have to live within these confines of the religion if you want to be a part of it. Same positions. But the upfront social cost that they present to you is completely different. With the NIFB, you know what you're signing up for when you join. They're complete nutcases. With Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll try to lure you in by portraying a, a much nicer, calmer group who supports you for who you are. And not until later will you find out that... You can't be a member unless you are no longer trans. That's it. You have to live your life like the gender you were assigned at birth, and that's it. You just can't be a member. But by the time they spring that on you, by the time you come to that realization, typically the sunk costs fallacy has kicked in, and you're going to feel like, Appeasing the members and leadership of this religion is worth more than your own feelings and thoughts and life. That's not just how it works for members of the LGBT community. That's how it works for basically everybody. You have to give things up to be a Jehovah's Witness because the, the religion is very and intentionally confining and constricting. So... The longer you learn about the religion, the more time you invest in it, the more likely it is you're going to make the changes required to be a member. To get back to your earlier question, what would 
happen if a Jehovah's Witness started calling on you and studying with you and things? The answer is they would love bomb you and make you think that you had their support, complete support, and then they would slowly but gradually reveal to you over months, most likely, that you had to be a, a completely different person or you wouldn't be allowed to join. Appreciate the uh, phone call. Very interesting question, and it should serve as a reminder why Jehovah's Witnesses are so toxic, because they want to change who you are, and no religion should ever try to change who you are like that. It's just, it's just straight up wrong. Hey, Owen. I'm, my name is James, and I'm from Austin. My current girlfriend is bisexual and I grow up and I've grown up in a extremely uh right wing Baptist church. Um what do you have any advice for me? Love your content man. Keep it up. I appreciate that. Um I will give you this advice. I took psychology classes in college. I went to college for substance abuse counseling. And something that we learned about were a number of cognitive distortions, is what they're called. They're basically fallacies that your brain latches onto that are unhealthy. One of the most important cognitive distortions that you should keep in mind when going through a relationship is something called the fallacy of change. On this page, I have 15 common cognitive distortions. These are things that you should be aware of and try to avoid if at all possible. Polarized thinking, like black and white thinking. Overgeneralizations, jumping to conclusions, catastrophizing, personalization, so on and so forth. The one I wanted to look at is right here, the fallacy of change. In the fallacy of change, a person expects that other people will change to suit them if they just pressure or cajole them enough. A person needs to change people because their hopes for success and happiness seem to depend entirely on them. This distortion is often found in thinking around relationships. For example, a girlfriend who tries to get her boyfriend to improve his appearance and manners in the belief that this boyfriend is perfect in every other way and will make them happy if they only change these few minor things. The idea behind the fallacy of change is you shouldn't want to change somebody. You should find your happiness from within yourself. I know that growing up ultra-religious gives you basically built-in anger or hatred or hesitance toward people who are a certain thing, like gay people or bi people or anybody from the LGBT community, I know that growing up religious will give you certain misconceptions or preconceptions about these people. I had to move past a lot of that stuff and realize that there is nothing wrong with being gay or being bi or anything like that. It's very difficult to come to those conclusions, even knowing the fact that there's nothing wrong with being gay or bi. It's still like this built-in feeling that you get that you have to force out of yourself and realize it's unreasonable and it's not true that there's something wrong with this. It's, it's going to be a complicated road for you to push this, these feelings aside, but it, it sounds like the fact that you're calling in and mentioning it at all means you probably realize that misconceptions or feelings that you have about bi or gay people are misplaced or inaccurate. So my advice for you would be to try to desensitize yourself to this stuff and try to base your feelings on this stuff in logic. There really is nothing wrong with it. That being said, you don't have to take part in anything that you don't want to take part in, i.e., if they want to push your relationship to a place that you don't want it to go, 
you don't have to go there. So remember that in everything and try to remember the fallacy of change. And I would also recommend you take a look at other cognitive distortions. Um, I, I mentioned a few of them in this, but you can look up cognitive distortions. There are a billion of them. And just being able to identify them in your everyday life is extremely useful. It's, it's something that I learned about when I was in school for substance abuse counseling was these cognitive distortions. And it's something that I learned when going to group therapy for addiction, too. Um, they're extremely valuable to know and recognize and understand. Hey, Owen. Love your show. Uh, I want to know if you know anything about the LDS Avow. Um, basically, it's a cult within the LDS church uh, that's preaching the end of times. And they're actually associated with uh, Lori Vallow, who her children uh, end up missing and found to be murdered. I don't know if you knew anything about it or if you have any thoughts or opinions on it, but I'd like to know what you think about it. Thanks. Bye. I appreciate that. Um, I had not, I had not heard of this before you mentioned it, but when I was listening to the voicemails, I decided to go look into it because it seemed interesting. And as it happens, there is something called the LDS preparedness manual. LDS Avow, the movement or the, the group or whatever it is, um, they've written preparedness manuals for when the end comes. They wrote one manual for um, leadership and one manual for general members of the church. And they are not easy to get your hands on. But I did get my hands on one of them. I think this is the membership one. So I figured we'd just kind of scroll through it a little bit, look at the table of contents, that kind of thing. You know, see what it has to say. The title is LDS Preparedness Manual. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. Proverbs 27, 12. Oh, interesting. Okay. This is, oh, okay. This is a 2011 member edition. That's what this version is. This is a, an opening note in the book. The contents of this booklet are intended to assist individuals and families in coping with emergency preparations. However, final decisions on, pre on preparation for actions taken during an emergency are the sole responsibility of individuals. No one knows your needs or can take care of you better than you can, nor does anyone else have that responsibility. Okay, let's take a look at the table of contents. Thinking about getting started. Preface... Book of Gomer Parable, Preparing for a Repeat of Hans Mill, Preparedness Test, Deluxe 96-Hour Kit. Oh, fascinating. Under Food Storage, it's got everything you'd need to know about it, apparently. Bare minimum food storage requirements, do you really have a year's supply, basic food list, monthly food storage purchasing calendar, the seven major mistakes in food storage, growing and using sprouts. Wow, they are serious about this shit. Infant formula. Pros and cons of freeze-dried, dehydrated, MRE, etc. Oxygen absorbers. Here are some of the subheadings under temporal preparation. Okay, but what do I prepare for? Surviving in the city, money, defense, clothing, emergency heating and cooking. All right, we've got to see, okay, but what do I prepare for? Let me search for it. Before you can prepare, you must determine what you're preparing to survive and how each disaster threatens you, your safety, and survival. That will give you the parameters necessary for the following steps. This initial exercise isn't tough and only takes a few minutes of thought. We suggest you jot notes or switch onto your word processor while you work. What's going to happen in the next five years? If we knew, our webpage would look different. You'll have to extrapolate, evaluate trends, read the newspaper, conduct your own research. At the very least, take a few minutes and consider your location. Pull out a map and look at what's within a 2-mile, 5-mile, 10-mile, and 25-mile radius of your home and place of work. Put on your pessimist hat and consider what might go wrong that could directly impact you. Decide if that's something you want to prepare for. Here are some questions to ask yourself. What natural disasters or extreme conditions am I, or we, likely to face in the next five years? Make a list and rank them in order of most to least likely to impact you. Your list might look like this. Weather-related, non-weather-related, like earthquake, volcano, or tidal wave. Man-made disasters. War, toxic, material emission or spill. 
riot or other civil disorder, fire, government action against you, stock market crash, sever depression, sever depression. Is that a natural disaster? Sever depression? <laughs> oh my God, these people. Plague or disease outbreak, comet strike or giant meteor, and then personal emergencies, kidnapping, unemployment, death and family, random acts of violence, mugging, robbery, or other criminal attacks, so on and so forth. What are the ramifications of each item on my list? There was another section I wanted to look at. It's at the very beginning of the book. Let me scroll up here. This is the opening, the book of Gomer parable. These are the generations of Gomer, son of Homer, son of Omer. And in the days of Gomer, Noah the prophet went unto the people, saying, Prepare ye for the flood which is to come. Yea, build yourselves a boat, that ye may not perish. I think that this is from the Book of Mormon, or some Mormon writing. I, this doesn't sound like it's from the Bible at all. I've never heard of Gomer, Homer, or Omer. Now Gomer was a member of the church and taught Sunday school and played, yea, even on the ward softball team. What? And Gomer's wife said unto him, Come, let us build unto ourselves a boat, as the prophet commandeth, that we may not perish in the flood. But behold, Gomer said unto his wife, Worry not, dear wife, for the flood comes, the government will provide boats for us. For if the flood comes. And Gomer did not build a boat, and Gomer's wife went unto Noah, and she returned, saying, Behold, honey, the prophet said unto us, saith unto us, Build a boat that we may preserve ourselves, for the government pays men not to grow trees, wherefore the government hath not the lumber to build for you a boat. Oh my God! Why is it written in Old English? This is ridiculous. The Book of Mormon was supposedly, it was supposed to have been written in like the 300s, right? And then it was translated in the 1800s, supposedly. Why is it written with 16th century, 17th century Old English? This is bizarre, dude, seriously. And Gomer answered saying, Fear not, O wife, for I am not the star pitcher on the ward softball team. Wherefore, the church will provide for us a boat that will perish not. Is this supposed to be, like, from, like, 2,000 years ago? They had softball teams back then? What the holy fuck is going on right now? Am I missing something? Somebody, please comment. If you're like a Mormon and, you, and this is like making sense to you, leave a comment and explain because this is making zero sense to me. Zero. Anyway, really fascinating group. I would like to read more of this book. It seems like it could legitimately be useful in some ways, but it does betray the perspective that some Mormons have the end times perspective that a lot of cults happen to have. A lot of cults tend to believe that the end is coming any five minutes now and they fear monger about it and tell you you should have food stores and, and all of this other shit. I can see a natural disaster taking place, like a huge snowstorm or a meteor strike or, or some other thing like that. I get it. There, the, you know, it's reasonable to prepare for some things, but Armageddon taking place is not one of those things. It's absolutely ridiculous. Me thinks. I recently left the Mormon church. I'm now into finding the truth about the church. I'm angry with the church and myself. Did you go through this? I did. Uh, I did go through a... a an angry phase, and the anger has turned to cold hatred in many ways of the Jehovah's Witness religion. I'm not angry with myself, because it ultimately wasn't really, it wasn't even a choice that I had. And it wasn't a choice that you had either. Whether you were born in or joined later is irrelevant. Free will is a religious concept, not a scientific one. If you weren't born in, then you joined because you believed that it was the best thing to do at the time. That's, that's why people do things, because they think that it's the, the best thing to do. They think that it will benefit them the most. So don't blame yourself for being in the religion. It is not your fault, ultimately, period. It's not.
as far as anger with the church goes, I definitely understand where you're coming from with that. It'll probably take a while to cool down, but with time, you will find more productive ways to deal with the anger. I found a productive way to deal with the anger, talking about it on YouTube. It's done a lot of good for me. I'm really glad that other people can benefit from my experiences in some way and hopefully avoid the mistakes that I made by hearing them out, by hearing me talk about what it was like to be inside the religion and things like that. I would recommend finding other people who have also been inside of a cult, like me. And there are a bunch of ex-Mormons on Twitter. They're all over the place, man. There, there is a vibrant community of ex-Mormons and more generally ex-cult members on the internet. So find them and, and link up with them and talk to them and talk about your experiences. Something else that helped me exit my angry phase to some extent was watching debates between big people and Christians, like the Bill Nye-Ken Ham debate. Absolutely loved watching that shit. It was so fascinating. Or the, um, the Christopher Hitchens versus the Catholic Church debate. That was interesting. Uh, Christopher Hitchens and Stephen Fry, I believe, did a debate against a couple of Catholics, maybe a nun and a deacon or something. I don't remember, but it was fascinating. Very, very fascinating. And watching that shit made me realize that I'm not crazy, and it helped me process a lot of the feelings that I had about, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and church in general. So give that a shot. Maybe it'll help out. Me thinks. I was born in, but I left at 46, and I hate the damage it may have caused my children. You were doing what you believed was the right thing. Everybody is a hero of their own story. You can't blame yourself for doing what you thought was right. Now we know that it wasn't right. Now we know, and we can move forward from here. We can figure things out and make the best decisions that we can with the information that we have. You didn't know at the time, and now you do. So don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up. How many Jehovah's Witnesses did I bring into the religion? I don't know. Maybe none. Maybe 100. Maybe 500. I don't know. I don't know how many people saw a, a little kid knocking on doors and thought to themselves, you know, they seem like such a nice religion. They're so great. They, they've got little kids helping out and he's so well behaved and all that junk. Who knows how many people saw me out there passing out magazines and tracts and were swayed by that. How many people did I bring in? I don't know. Probably not many, realistically. But either way, even if it was 2,000, I cannot blame myself for that. I was doing what I thought was the right thing. So don't beat yourself up. Don't look to the past. Just look forward and do the best you can with the information you have. Let's take a look at Super Chats. Zolfner, I'm by. I'm okay. I guess I was summoned. WTF, lol. Huh. Yeah, uh, I don't know, man. There are a lot of preconceptions and misconceptions relating to the LGBT community coming out of religion, and it's really fucking sad. It's really heartbreaking. I can't stand it. Zolfner, I've been receiving a lot of hate because I tweeted myself to AOC at a Trump rally. I was giving food away at the Hills yesterday. Interesting. I know you know what love bombing is. I've talked about it on my channel plenty. I bet those people at the rally were awfully nice, weren't they? I find it fascinating when people talk about how nice people are at Trump rallies. They're so nice. And you tell them that you're a Biden supporter and you're just there to check it out. And they're just so nice anyways. That's called love bombing. When we come back, we're going to talk about a West Virginian candidate for House of Representatives and his questionable and possibly felonious history. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. 
you're listening to the Telltale channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. So the first article I want to take a look at is entitled Anti West Virginia House Candidate Has Restraining Order for Stalking Women. This is by Hemant Mehta on the Friendly Atheist website. So let's give it a read and see what it says. Earlier this year, a conservative activist named Derek Evans ran in the GOP primary for a seat in West Virginia's House of Delegates. This is really disappointing to me because, of course, I'm from West Virginia, or I live in West Virginia anyways. And every time I see an article about West Virginia, I have to give it a read. And every time, I'm disappointed. Every single time. Let's continue reading. Perhaps to show off his right-wing bona fides before the election, he posted a rant on Facebook about the book It's Perfectly Normal. He also complained that the book wasn't anti-gay enough. Oh, big surprise. Did anybody really need to hear that he was a GOP candidate? Did anyone think he might have been a Democrat rather than a Republican? Seriously? Why is it that every time there's a batshit crazy story about a batshit crazy representative like this, it's always a Republican? I don't get it, man. Seriously, why? It's like the most anti-gay preachers tend to get caught with, like, male prostitutes, like Ted Haggard, for example. Why? I don't understand. Anyway, let's continue reading. Evans ended up advancing in that primary, and he's one of four candidates on the ballot next week. Two will earn seats in the state house. Boosting his candidacy, he recently received an endorsement from West Virginia Troopers Association. But in the most predictable political scandal imaginable, it seems that Evans has a restraining order against him because he was caught harassing women. But local law enforcement officials were unaware of that when they supported his candidacy. I don't know, man. He's still a complete nutbag. Like, the legal issues aside, the guy seems like an obnoxious fucking idiot. Uh, so it's an embarrassment that West Virginia Troopers Association would endorse somebody like this anyways. But let's continue reading. This is a quote. Evans was found by a Kanaw County magistrate last year to have engaged in stalking and made repeated credible threats of bodily injury to a woman who worked at the Women's Health Center in Charleston, West Virginia. It's the state's only facility to offer abortion services. Nine days after he was served, Evans violated that restraining order, leading to an extension that does not expire until December 31st, 2020. Court documents provided by one victim's attorney show County Magistrate Joseph L. Shelton granted the order, saying Evans made credible threats and engaged in stalking, as defined by the West Virginia State Code. Evans was ordered by the courts to stay away from the victim, including her place of work, but nine days after being served, Evans showed back up at the Women's Health Center. Big fucking surprise. Is anybody surprised by this behavior? He's an extremist, in case nobody was catching on to that. Guy is an extremist. When Charleston police officers responded to a call that Evans was violating a restraining order by being at the center, he gave them false information about the court order. It seems strange to me that he could get away with giving them false information in the first place because the woman that filed the restraining order in the first place was the one who called the police. They should have been perfectly aware of what was happening. They should have looked this shit up before arresting this guy or, or going and talking to him or picking him up or whatever else. They should have looked it up or had one of their friends look it up on their way to the health center. He shouldn't have been able to get away with giving out false information on the restraining order. Let's continue reading. This is Hemant Mehta. The guy's an all-around creep. It's possible he'll win an election despite being under a restraining order because he couldn't stop stalking women. Welcome to the modern Republican Party. The West Virginia Troopers Association says they'll discuss the endorsement at their next meeting, whenever that is, and consider rescinding it. But it may be too late by then. The point is still clear, though. Evans is a monster, and the West Virginia Troopers Association has shitty judgment. No surprise on either count. 
it's West Virginia, man. This place is this place is Trump country. That's what it is. This place is Trump country and all that entails. They are obsessed with right-wing extremism in this state. I wish that there was some way to move them over on this issue and try to make West Virginia more of a progressive stronghold, but I am not holding my breath. In 2016, West Virginia voted solidly red. Every district in West Virginia voted Trump. Every single district. It's so red in West Virginia that they almost don't even bother doing polls here. I think they did one or two this year. And it was like 70% in Trump's favor. Big surprise. When we come back, we're going to talk about a pastor telling men to make sure their wives vote the same way they do. So give us 30 seconds and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Telltale Channel. Don't forget to check me out on all social media, Patreon, Twitter, Teespring, and Etsy. All links can be found in the description or on my website, telltaleatheist.com. The next article I want to look at is entitled Conservative Christian Leader, A Man is Responsible for How His Wife Votes, quote unquote. This is by Hemant Mehta on the Friendly Atheist website. So let's give it a read and see what it has to say. In a tweet that's practically designed to be ratioed, Jesse Sumter, a staffer at the Church of COVID-denying Doug Wilson, says that men have a duty to control the way their wives vote. Can we guess? how this guy votes. Can we guess which party affiliation he is? Is he a Democrat or is he a Republican? Place your votes now. Let's look at the tweet he sent. Brothers, a friendly reminder for elections. Make sure your wife votes exactly as you do. Well, that's uh, kind of demeaning, isn't it? It's like women don't have any individuality. It's like they can't make decisions for themselves. Men are the head of the household, I guess, after all, aren't they? Here's another tweet from him. Welcome to the party. I am serious about this. The husband is responsible for how his wife votes. He should not be abusive or a jerk about this, and he should seek counsel from his wife on elections. But at the end of the day, he is responsible. A few reasons. They should be united in voting. The husband makes sure this happens. This is fucking bizarre. This just shows the kind of viewpoint that some of these pastors have about how a family should function. The man makes all of the decisions, and all of their decisions are final. Women are there to follow instructions. If they vote differently, they cancel each other out. If they vote differently, the husband leaves his wife unprotected. If the husband won't vote for a guy, why would he let his wife do it? Why would he let his wife do it? I don't let my girlfriend do anything, like literally ever. She does things on her own because she's an individual. This viewpoint on society is so fucking disgusting. This is why women are considered a minority when they're 52% of the population. Because the actual minority insists on being in control in all situations. It's absolutely ridiculous. Let's keep reading. This is Hemant Mehta. To be sure, right now, I would be disturbed if my partner voted for Donald Trump, but mostly because it would suggest our values are not as aligned as I thought they were. If we vote the same way, even for down-ballot races, it's because we're looking for similar things in candidates. But that's a far cry from what Sumter is saying, which is that it's a husband's responsibility to make sure the wife is voting exactly how he tells her to. I agree. I don't think I would want to be with somebody who would vote for Donald Trump. And the reason is because our values, our moral compass would be so completely separate and different from each other. I don't know how we would survive together. 
Like somebody who would vote for Donald Trump. I could not respect them as a significant other. I would never be with somebody like that. I, I couldn't do it. If they have conservative leanings or conservative values, I'm down. Let's talk about this shit. Challenge me mentally. Make me think about things. I am so down. But a Donald Trump supporter? No. Absolutely no fucking way. The difference between me saying that and Jesse Sumter saying that he's concerned that wives will not vote the same way that their husbands vote, the difference here is the fact that Christians, extreme evangelical Christians like this guy, get married as young as possible because there's no such thing as premarital sex with them, and they stay married until the day they die. The first person to come along, they marry, and they will stick with them until death do us part, and that's fucking toxic. That's bad. I saw this happen all the time in Jehovah's Witnesses. Kids would get married at 18 years old the moment they were legally allowed to because their brains are just going nuts with all of the hormones and everything going on up there. They can't deal with being alone anymore. Mormons have this thing, I believe, called the Young Persons or YPS, Young Persons. I don't remember. Anyway, it's basically a, a whole church where young adults go and they young adults go to meet other singles young single adults it's ysa that's what it is ysa i believe young single adults church they'll go there from like 18 years old until like 28 or something when they're done with their mission serving their mission they'll go to the ysa young single adults church and meet others they want to get you married as young as humanly possible and you're going to stay in that marriage until the day you die. Doesn't matter if you agree politically. Doesn't matter if you change your political beliefs uh, in 10 years. Doesn't matter if you got married and you were both Republicans, but now you're starting to see that there's a lot of propaganda spreading around about Donald Trump and you know Mitt Romney and all of the others. Doesn't matter. You're going to stay married whether you like it or not. Because that's what God wants. It was a God-ordained marriage. Doesn't matter if the person that you're with is a cheater. You, your responsibility as a Christian is to try to maintain that relationship through thick and thin, no matter what. It's absolutely wrong. And that's why you find conservative Christian extremists talking about things like this. Talking about how you should make sure your wife votes the same way you vote because there is an inherent assumption there that the two people that are together are incompatible. There's a real possibility that these two people are incompatible. A strong possibility, strong enough possibility that he wants to make note of it and make sure people know that whether you're incompatible or not, the man is in charge and he makes the decisions and the woman will vote the, the, the same way the man votes, whether she likes that or not, because he is the head of the family and he's God ordained and he makes the final decisions, period. So if the wife is liberal, she's voting for Trump anyways. Think about the mindset in this whole situation. Seriously, really try to process this viewpoint. Try to process the lives that these people are living. It's fucking sad. It's really fucking sad. Let's keep reading. To be sure, right now, I would be disturbed if my partner voted for Donald Trump, but mostly because it would suggest our values are not as aligned as I thought they were. If we vote the same way, even for down-ballot races, it's because we're looking for similar things in candidates. But that's a far cry from what Sumter is saying, which is that it's a husband's responsibility to make sure his wife is voting exactly how he tells her. The alternative, I guess, is that she would be making a decision without running it by him, and then what's even the point of marriage? Sumter says he's against abuse, but no doubt a man raised to think he must control what his wife does in a voting booth is a man more likely to be abusive. 
The responses to this thread, even from many Christians, are an utter rejection of this kind of patriarchal control. This is from Knapp Nasworth, quote, Hi, Jesse. Here's a foolproof method to make sure you and your wife vote the same way. Ask your wife who she's voting for. Vote how she's voting. Hope that helps. Basically making the point that she can vote how you vote, or, or, bear with me, you can vote how she votes. Here's a quote from Sherry B. An important reminder for wives. Voter intimidation is illegal even if it's your husband. Your vote is no one's business but your own. Lie to him about how you vote if you have to in order to avoid his abuse. Also, Jesse, Jesus does not say force your wife to do things. Well said. Here's a quote from Switchway. Respectfully, my wife is an individual. We are Christians. We are semi-conservative. She can do whatever she wants. I respect her and her decisions. We will cancel each other out this year. That's fine. Millions will cancel each other out. That's how elections work. I agree. Um, but that's a little bit concerning to me that their values are so far off from each other that they're voting for... This happened in 2020. So one is voting for Donald Trump, one's voting for Biden. It's a little bit worrying to me that they are so far apart in this polarized country that one's voting for one and the other's voting for the other. But I appreciate the fact that they're both okay with that. It's concerning that their values are so different that they're voting for different people in this specific election. But I, I like that they are okay with that. It seems like a semi... That, it's a sign of a healthy relationship. I don't know if it's healthy or not. Who knows? I don't know the people. But that's a good sign. Hey, V La Bianca. I know V. That's a whole lot of words to say I'm a controlling asshole. I hear that. This one's from Mavis Meelan. I've been married for 22 years. I'm religious. My faith is strong and very personal. My marriage is very strong, unshakable. No one tells me how to vote, and my husband would never try to. He respects me, loves me, honors me. You really are messed up. I'm sorry, but you are. Let's keep reading. This is Hemant Mehta again. It's no surprise that a guy who helps run an ultra-conservative church would be telling men to keep their wives in check. It's disturbing, though, how many people might see his message and think there's nothing wrong with it at all. Since his initial tweet, Sumter has attempted to explain himself in greater length, and he's not doing himself any favors. Maybe he should have had his wife edit the piece. Here's how he argues this is all about protecting her. This is a quote. Run the scenario. You, as the husband, vote third party and your wife votes for Trump. At the next get-together, people are talking about who they voted for. You say third party and your wife says Trump. All eyes turn to her and ask her, why did you vote for Trump? Defend that position. And there you are as the guy left to drink punch alone in the corner while your wife tries to fend off the accusations. It is foolishness on the husband's part to leave his wife vulnerable. If there's a hard decision to be made, the choice should go back to the husband and he should have skin in the game. He should be ready to answer for it. Brothers, don't let her vote in such a way that she's left unprotected. Being the leader means you take the brunt of the questions and objections and concerns. You should lead in the voting decisions because when the questions come, you should be ready with the answers. Or she can be ready with the answers. Is she too stupid to defend her decisions? Is that what it is? Is the implication here that women just aren't smart enough to make decisions for themselves, or smart enough to know why they made the decisions that they made? Is that what he's saying? If she voted against her husband and votes for Trump, or even votes for Biden, whoever, I assume she has a good reason to do that, right? Either way, in my opinion, the husband should have the wife's back in that situation, even if like, if my girlfriend voted for Trump and I voted for Biden, she never would, never. But even if she did and we were at a family get-together and somebody pointed fingers at her, I would still jump in and try to soften the blow. I would have some hard questions for her, too. But in my opinion, when you're a couple, I have always tried to have the other person's back in all situations, no matter what. If I disagreed with them on something, if I felt like they did the wrong thing or, or, or whatever, 
I will have her back, period. And we'll sort the rest out later. In public, I, it's always a united front. If I'm around other people, I, it's always a united. She and I are a pair, and we work together in everything. If I actually do disagree with her on something, we'll work it out after. That's, that's, that's kind of my life philosophy with everything. And um, that's how it's been with her, too. She's always had my back with everything in public, and, and we work it all out later. I don't know. That's just how I work in relationships, I guess. It doesn't really matter, ultimately, though. In this hypothetical scenario that Jesse Sumter is drawing up, the wife, if she made a decision, she should be perfectly ready to defend that decision, in my opinion. Whether the husband is going to be a fucking dickhead or not. Whether he's going to decide to throw her under the bus or not, um, she should be prepared to defend any decision that she makes. But women aren't stupid. They're not inferior. They're not lesser than anybody. They're, women are just as intelligent as men. Uh, you know, Everybody is equally as intelligent as everybody else. We're all humans. I trust women to make decisions just as much as I trust men to make decisions, and suggesting otherwise is fucking disgusting to me. Let's keep reading. There's an assumption there that the wife must be too stupid to be able to defend herself, and it's up to the man to rescue her. That's absurd enough to begin with, and it's only more ridiculous here because the husband must be even more foolish than his wife for voting third party in 2020. Don't take voting advice from a conservative Christian who thinks some people can't be trusted to make up their own minds. Better yet, don't take marriage advice from him either. Incidentally, this past May, Abby Johnson also said she longed to return to a time when women couldn't make up their own political minds, saying that in a godly household, the husband would get the final say. She was roundly mocked for that. The belief is still popular in her circles, though. Anybody wondering if misogyny still exists? I mean, you can't wonder that and be a serious person. Let me take a quick glance at Super Chats. Zolfner, Republican, and I openly do gay stuff. Hush, Owen. Zelfner, not a Donald supporter, just Republican. I can go on for days how rate sit, rate, R8 sit, Democrats are. They use me. They don't help me. Well, I can give you, I can tell you this. Um, Democrats, the policies instituted by Democrats, uh, by Democrat leaders, objectively help you more than the policies instituted by Republican leaders, for better or worse. Republican leadership is absolutely fucking disgusting to me. I don't know how anybody can look themselves in the mirror and support some of the people at the top of the leadership hierarchy. It's, it's bizarre. But anyways, uh, you voted Biden, so there's that. That's where I'm going to end it for the night. I appreciate you guys coming on and giving this a listen, and I will talk to you next week. If you like what I do and you want to make sure I can continue to do it, you can support me in a few ways. First, you can support me on Patreon. That's probably the best way. But if you want to get something back for your support, you can check out my Teespring. I sell all kinds of shirts and stickers and stuff on there. Second, you can support me by checking out my Etsy store. I sell 3D printed stands for every system from the original Nintendo to the Xbox One. And finally, if you want to support me in other ways, you can check me out on my other channels. I have the podcast channel, which is where I talk about whatever's on my mind. Politics, social issues, Issues, whatever. You can also find it everywhere podcasts can be found. Or you can check out the videos on my main channel where I focus on destructive cults. As it is with most channels these days, I rely on the support of viewers like you to keep my channel alive, so sharing my work is extremely helpful. Anyways, check me out in all those places if you haven't already. Thanks for listening, guys.